We decided to have two uh, meetings, one at the City University tonight, and then on Sunday afternoon at the ECC Church in Hong Kong Island. That will continue, that will go on. The one at City University unfortunately was shut down yesterday because Muslims complained on campus that this was not proper, this kind of material is not proper for a university campus, which is fascinating since everything I'm going to do tonight is academic. This is straight academic material, which you would assume should be discussed on a university campus. If you don't discuss this kind of material on a campus, where else do you discuss it? I don't know of any Christians anywhere that have banned any meetings by anyone who confronts or criticizes the Bible. Do you? Have we ever done this? What's interesting is some of you may know what the Muslims have put out. Have you seen what they have put out this week? Read and see what they have said about me. It's slanderous what they're saying about me. That I spread lies, that I provoke and incite Muslims, that I'm a hateful preacher, highly disrespectful towards Islam. Just by asking questions about the Quran, I have been named all of these things, and they have banned Muslims from coming to this meeting. Are there any Muslims here tonight? One. One Muslim has there. Thank you, sir, for coming. You're the only one that's It's fascinating to me that Muslims will not show up at these meetings. Unless Muslims are going to listen to this material, they're not going to know how to defend it. But what I want to do tonight is go through this material. I want you to be the first to see it, because some of the material I'm introducing tonight will be the first time it's ever been introduced. Others of the material that I'm going to introduce, some of you may already know. So let's get right into it, and let's ask this question. Now, unfortunately, I don't have my computer in front of me because we, cannot be able, we aren't able to set it up so that I can see what I'm looking at. So I'm going to have to look at that screen as I go along uh, from slide to slide. So forgive me if I don't. I, I can't read that. It's too small. I'm 65 years old and my eyesight just isn't good enough to get that far. So I'm going to have to look the same direction you are. So forgive me for looking that direction. But let's go ahead. What do Muslims claim? Well, Muslims almost everywhere in the world do claim four things. Whether they are radical, whether they are nominal, or possibly not the liberals, but certainly the radical and the nominals would say four things. That the Quran is a book that is eternal. It's not just they that claim that. The Quran itself makes that claim in Surah 85, Ayah 22. Inimitable is certainly part of that claim. It is uncreated. Therefore, it has always existed eternally on clay tablets in heaven. Number two, that the Quran was sent down between 610 and 632 to a man named Muhammad there in Arabia. Number three, that the Quran was finally completed by Uthman in 652, 20 years after Muhammad died, roughly 20 years after Muhammad died. It was finally written down in its canonical form. And the number four, that the Quran that I have in my hand here, this Quran, the Arabic part of the Quran, not the English translation, but the Arabic, that this Quran is exactly the same Quran that exists on those eternal tablets sent down to Muhammad and canonized by Uthman in 652. Those are the claims that you hear, and if there are any other claims, and if I am incorrect on that, then please do correct me. For 37 years, I've heard those four claims about the Quran. Now, we cannot confront the first two, uncreated, sent down, because how do you confront eternality? How do you front, confront whether or not it was sent down? We aren't living in the seventh century. But we can confront the last two, number three and four, and that's what I'm gonna to do tonight. I'm going to ask Muslims anywhere, those of us, this is all going up on the internet by next week. So I want to ask all the Muslims to answer the second two claims. Show me one Quran that is from the 7th century, 652, that's complete and unchanged. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Now how am I going to do that? Well, let's continue on. We would never make this claim about the Bible. No Christians, I hope, would say that the Bible is eternal no of course not it was created 
Every Muslim, every Christian knows that it was created. We know who created it. We know and gave the names to many of the authors of many of the books. We know it was written by men. It does not exist in heaven on any tablets. Secondly, sent down? No, it was not sent down to anyone. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but not sent down. Matthew wrote Matthew, John wrote John, Moses wrote the first five books, Jeremiah wrote Jeremiah. So we give the names to many of the books of the authors, about 33 of them, written in three different languages on three different continents over a period of 1400 years. Complete, in its original form, we would admit to the third category that it was complete at the time that it was written, but we, it, we don't have any of the originals. And there's, we would be very clear on that and very transparent. Unchanged? No, of course it's been changed. We know where the changes are, and we are very transparent about it. In my uh, Bible, it's very clear that Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to 20, has a line before it warning the readers that possibly these were added at a later date. We don't have the originals in the Greek text. Uh, John chapter 7, verse 53 to John 8, verse 11, we have, in my Bible, there's a line above and below that portion of scripture that stipulates very clearly that these are not found in the earliest Greek manuscripts. First John chapter 5 verse 7 should not be there and most of our Bibles we've taken it out. So we're aware that about 40 verses in the Bible should not be there. So we are very clear. No one would doubt that I hope in this room that it has been changed. Of course it is. So we would not make the same claims that the Muslims make about the Quran. But what's our remit today? We cannot critique the imprinted part or sent down. We can only critique the archaic, complete, and unchanged Quran. Thus, we want to find one Quran, just one Quran, dated from the mid 7th century, complete and unchanged. That's all I'm asking tonight. What I want to do is 11 different areas. Now, we're going to be here a long time. I'm sorry about this, so put your pens down. You're not going to keep up with me. But I'm going to go through every one of these areas. What do modern Muslim leaders claim? What did early Muslim scholars say? The historical anachronisms in the Quran, the source criticism, the two compilations of the Quran, the six earliest chronic manuscripts, two layers of the solemn palimpsest, the four carbon dating lab reports, the late diacritical variants, the early consonantal variants, and then we get to end with the history of the 1924 Hafs canonized text. So every one of these are going to be unpacked as we go through. So let's start with the first one. What do modern Muslim leaders claim? Fatullah Gulen says only one Quran, there's only one Quran, unaltered, edited, and untampered. The Quranic text is entirely reliable. It has not been altered, edited, or tampered with for the last 1400 years. Susan Hanif, a convert to Islam, goes a step further. It's preserved today in its original form. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, he is actually uh, one of the great translators of the Quran into English, says not even a single letter has been changed. The correct Arabic text we have today is identical to the text as it was revealed to the Prophet. Malvi Muhammad Ali says from Lahore, he was a leader of the Ahmadiyya sect, said not even a diacritical point has changed, not even a dot that are above and below the lines has changed. Dr. Shabir Ali, a friend of mine, I've debated him six times, says it is exactly identical for over 1300 years. We can compare that with what we're reading today and we find them to be exactly identical. And he's talking about the Ma'il Codex, which is there in the British Library. So the British Library Quran is exactly the same as the Quran we have today. He goes on and says that Muslims have not quarreled over what is the text. The text was known through memory work and through the written material. And for 1400 years ago, that looking at the Tashkent, he mistakenly puts it into Russia where it's not. The Samarkand manuscript he's referring to. And he says of it, we find no difference from that copy to what we're reading today. So both the Ma'il Quran, the 2165 manuscript, and the Samarkand manuscript, two of the six major manuscripts, he says, are 13 and 1400 years old. Listen to the claims they're making. The problem is, this is not what the earliest Muslims said. The Quran we have today, they're saying, has not changed one iota since its inception 1400 years ago, but is what, that what the earliest Muslim scholars believed? Let's look at what they said concerning the Quran. Now, there are six authoritative hadiths 
Al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Dawud, Tirmidhi, Sugra, and Ibn Majah. But there are others that wrote similarly at the same time. Let's look and see what they said about the Quran. Now, these were all written in the late, late uh, 9th century into the 10th century. So there are 240 and later years after Muhammad. These are much later texts, but these are the earliest material that Muslims have that speak about the Quran. What did they say about the Quran? According to Abin Abi Dawud, some of the verses were lost. According to Asyuti, writing in the 1500s, some verses were disappeared. According to Sahih Muslim, some verses were forgotten. According to Sahih al-Bukhari, considered to be the most authoritative because he's the first to write down the Hadith trans, uh, compilations. He dies in 870, and he says, we used to read a verse of the Quran revealed in their connection, but later the verse was canceled. Al-Bukhari goes on to say that some verses are missing. Among what Allah revealed was the verse of Rajab, that's the verse on stoning. We did recite this verse and understood and memorized it. Allah's apostle did carry out the punishment of stoning. I am afraid that after a long time has passed, somebody will say by Allah, we do not find the verse of Rajab in Allah's book. And that's referring to chapter 24, ayah 2, or surah 24, ayah 2, which has now been changed to a hundred lashes for those who commit adultery. Some of the verses were overlooked. According to Ibn Abi Dawud, you have overlooked two verses and have not written them. According to Muwatta Ibn Malik, some verses were changed. Write it this way. This is according to Aisha. And she added that she had heard it so off, so from the Apostle of Allah, one of the wives of Muhammad. Ibn Abi Dawud refers to that some verses that were modified. Eleven modifications he talks about. But Allah said, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. That's Sahih Buhari. That's also found in the Quran itself, in Surah 2, Ayah 106, in Surah 16, Ayah 101, which is the verse of abrogation in the Quran. And then some of the verses were eaten by sheep, according to Sunnah Ibn Majah in 1277. So, lost, disappeared, forgotten, canceled, missing, overlooked, changed modified, substituted, eaten by sheep. Does this sound like a book which was compiled perfectly and completely? Does this not imply intentional human intervention right through its initial compilation? Can you see what the Muslim scholars are saying today and what the Muslim scholars said back in the 9th and 10th century are not the same thing? So this is a modern reflection of what modern scholars know today, not what the earliest Muslim scholars used to say. Let's look at some of the historical anachronisms since we're doing a historical critique of the Quran. And we, there are many historical anachronisms. I'm just going to give you a few to show what we now know. When you look at the Quran, you will find that the Quran introduces a Samaritan much too early in Surah 20. The Samiri has led them astray. So Moses returned to his people and asked, and what is your case, O Samiri? Yet Samaritans did not exist at the time of Moses in 1400 BC. The Samaritans were created by Sargon II in 722 BC. And this is very well known historically. Basically, the Quran is referring to Samaritans 700 years too early. All right, let's go back. In a mosque too early, Chapter 17, verse 1, refers to the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, to the As Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. But there is, there was no mosque in Jerusalem at the time of 621 when Muhammad went up there. The, the earliest of any mosque that we know of is at, at the latest would be 652 when Jerusalem was finally conquered. But if they're referring to the Dome of the Rock, that was built in 691. And the Masjid al-Aqsa that this verse is referring to was built in 710. So it cannot even be the Jewish temple of Jerusalem as it was destroyed in 70 AD. So what mosque in Jerusalem is that verse referring to? Obviously, this is a much later redaction coming from a much later period, but historically completely inaccurate. And coats of chainmail are too early in Surah 34. And we made pliable for him iron, make full coats of mail, and calculate precisely the links, referring to David who lived in 1000 BC. 
The problem is coats of chainmail were not invented in two, until 200 BC, 800 years later. David could not have had chainmail that early. It also misplaces crucifixions too early. In chapter 7, verse 120 to 124, Pharaoh said to the sorcerers at the time of Moses, that indeed, I will surely crucify you all. Then in Surah 7, uh, 20, verse 71, Pharaoh said to the magicians at the time of Moses in 14 BC, I will crucify you. Then in chapter 12, verse 41, Pharaoh says to a baker at the time of Joseph, 1800 BC, he will be crucified. But there were no crucifixions at the time of Moses, nor were there any crucifixions at the time of Joseph, who lived in 1800 BC. Moses lived in 1400 BC. Crucifixions were first introduced in 500 BC. Thus, the Quran's crucifixions are in the wrong place and 1,000 to 1,300 years too early. Then denies the crucifixion of Jesus in Surah 4, Ayah 157, and they did not kill him, nor did crucify him. If anything, they should have got that crucifixion correct. Because historically, almost everybody knows there was a crucifixion. Just take a look at Thallus, a Greek historian who is arguing about the crucifixion of Jesus in 52 AD. That's 20 years after Christ's death. He was not a Christian. He was a Greek historian. <coughs> Josephus was a Jewish historian who not only talked about the crucifixion of Jesus, but mentioned that the Christians believe he rose again. And then you have Tacitus, a Roman historian who hated Christians, had nothing good to say about Christians, but not only spoke about the crucifixion of Jesus, placed it at the time of uh, Pontius Pilate under the rule of Tiberius and that's why we know it was 33 AD because of Tacitus. So there you have Greek, Roman and also Jewish historians who are all writing in the first to second century all showing that there was a crucifixion. Where does the Quran get its authority from for the fact that Jesus wasn't crucified? This was written according to Muslims 600 years later It's also got the wrong Mary in Surah 19, Ayah 28. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is referred to as the sister of Aaron. In chapter 66, verse 12, Miriam, the first Saint Mary, who is the mother of Jesus, is the daughter of Imran. Surah 20, Ayah 30, Aaron, my Moses, my Moses' brother. Now, we do know that there is an Aaron in the Old Testament who did have a father named Amran, which is the Hebrew name for Imran in Arabic. And they did have a brother uh, Aaron did have a brother named Moses. Both Aaron and Moses did have a sister named Miriam. It looks like whoever wrote the Quran confused the Mary from 1400 BC with the mother of Jesus from the first century AD. Can you see the problem here? They confused the wrong Mary. There's 1400 years between them. Unless Mary lived for an awful long time, it cannot be the same Mary. It confuses the Qibla in the Kaaba. Surah 2, Ayah 144, 149 to 150. It, notice it, it says that the Qibla was facing, though it doesn't say Mecca, it just says to the, the, the uh, place of the Prophet, yet we know that there are now four Qiblas. That's for a whole other lecture. I don't have time to get into that tonight. But we have found that all the earliest Qiblas and all the earliest mosques, 65 that we have looked at, of the first 17 that exist, all the way up until 706, Muhammad died in 632, the Qibla was canonized according to Surah. Surah 2, 144 in 621, sorry, 624, until 706, every Qibla for every mosque is facing Petra in Jordan, 600 miles too far north. So, of course, historically speaking, we find another anachronism. In the Kaaba, in Surah 595 and 2, and you can see the references there on the screen, Abraham and Ishmael supposedly built the Kaaba. However, the historical record has Abraham way up in Cana, that's 600 miles further north. Kissing the Blackstone was a Nabataean worship process before Abraham, and again, 600 miles too far north. It confuses Pharaoh, the Tower of Babel, and Haman. In, in Surah 28, verse 38, O Haman, upon the clay, and make for me a tower. In Surah 40, I have 36 to 37, Pharaoh said, O Haman, construct me a tower that I might reach the heavens. The problem is that Haman, first of all, is not even a is not even an Egyptian name. Egypt never built any towers; they built pyramids and temples. Haman was not an Egyptian, but a Persian. Esther three one talks about Haman was the minister of the Persian king Ahasuerus. 
Pharaoh lived in 1500 BC, Haman lived in 510 BC, neither of them ever met. They were hundreds of years apart. So you can see these historical anachronisms put doubt to even the internal content. And it makes Alexander the Great an amazing engineer. So 18 I and 96, bring me sheets of iron between the two mountain walls that I may pour over it molten copper. So he builds an iron and copper wall between two mountains in 330 BC. This would be one of the greatest engineering fe fe uh, feats in the history of mankind. Why have we not been told about this? And where is that wall today? We have three different biographies of, Abra of Alexander from 300 BC. Not one of them referred to a wall of this magnitude. And it refers to futuristic coins, the didham, way too early. Surah 12, Ayah 20, a few didhams counted out, referring to selling Joseph for a few kittens out. Now, Joseph lived in 1800 BC. Coins were not even created until the 600s by the Lydians. Didhams were introduced in 660, post-661, by the Sufiani family. So could this be a later redaction? Conclusion, the authors of the Quran do not seem to know history very well. God would not make these kind of mistakes. This is further proof that the Quran includes intentional human interventions. What about where the Quran came from? Let's now investigate the sources of the Quran. Now we're going to go to source criticism. This is what Muslims claim. That the Quran is eternal word of God. Its source comes from these eternal tablets preserved in heaven, Surah 85, verse 22. It was revealed to correct the errors of previous revelations. It is unfettered by human intervention. Therefore, it does not come from man, but from God. That's what the Quran makes, and that's what Muslims claim today. Yet when you look at the stories in the Quran, you will find that there are stories after stories that are not found in the Bible, yet they are found in the Quran that can be sourced back to post-biblical writings. Surah 5, Ayah 32, the story of Cain and Abel. Cain killing his brother Abel, not knowing what to do with the body, and follows the example of a raven giving and burying its partner, and he does the same with his brother. That is not found in the Bible for one very good reason. That was written by the tar in the Targum of Jonathan ben Uzziah in the second century AD. And then in the Mishnah Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin verse 32 then appears referring to the blood of Abel. He who takes the blood of one is if he takes the blood of all. He who saves the blood of one is if he saves the blood of all. In verse 32, that was introduced in the Bar Sanhedrin chapter 4 verse 5 in the late 5th century. Both the story of Cain and Abel in verse 31 and the story of the blood of Abel in verse 32 were borrowed from an apocryphal account, a Jewish apocryphal account, written in the late 5th century. We know who wrote it, we know when it was written, we know, even know why it was written. This does not come from God. And no re the reason it's not in the Bible is because the Bible had long been canonized long before the 2nd century AD. When you look at Solomon and Sheba in Surah 27, Ayah 17 to 44, uh, too long a story to go into, but when you read it, you will find Solomon had an air force of birds. I had no idea Solomon had an air force of birds that would fly up over the enemy, drop stones on the enemy with the name of the enemy on the bottom. When he, the Hoopa bird goes and introduces him to the Queen of Sheba, when she comes into the throne room to meet Solomon, there is a pond in the middle of the floor, and as she is walking across, she picks up and pulls up her skirts to keep them from getting wet. Now, have any of you heard this story in the Bible before? None of you, for one very good reason. This comes from the second Targum of Esther, a second century apocryphal account written long after the Bible was written, written by Jews basically for the entertainment of their children. How did that story get into the Quran? What about Jesus? Jesus in the palm tree. Telling his mother how to basically eat from the palm tree and having the palm tree bend down to give the fruit to Mary. I had no idea that Jesus was able to teach his mother how to eat, but that according to the Quran, this is how it was done. Where does that story come from? It comes from the last books of the Bible, a second century sectarian account, never considered to be authoritative by Christians. It, that's why it's not in the Bible, because it was written much, much too late. Yet it finds its way into the Quran. Other further borrowed Jewish and Christian sources. The story of Mary, Imran, and Zachariah comes from the Proto-Evangelion's James the Lesser, a second century apocryphal account. 
creating birds out of clay in Surah 3, Ayah 49. That comes from Thomas's Gospel of the Infancy of Jesus Christ, 2nd century, second century. Surah 5, Ayah 31, burying a raven, I've already talked about that. Surah 7, Ayah 171, raising mountains comes from the Abadassara, a 2nd century apocryphal account. Baby Jesus talking from the cradle it comes from the first gospel of the infancy of Jesus Christ, another 2nd century account. And then Abraham destroying all idols in the Kaaba in Mecca. In Surah 21, Ayah 51 to 71 comes from the Mishnah of Rabbah. These are all Jewish and Christian apocryphal writings written long after the Bible was created, never accepted by either the Jewish or the Christian community as authoritative, yet they find their way into the Quran. Fascinating. These Barongs suggest that the creators of the Quran borrowed the wrong material. Why is it that they borrowed these stories and not the authentic stories from the Bible themselves? There is the million dollar question. We'll give you the answer. The Bible, both the Old and New Testament, were not translated into Arabic until the mid to late 8th century. The earliest translation we have of the New Testament in Arabic is known as the Codex Arabic, the Arabic Codex of Sinai 151. It's in St. Catherine's Monastery, and the date for that codex, the earliest Arabic translation of the New Testament, is 867 AD. That's the late 9th century. Since the Muslims had not, didn't have the Bible in Arabic in either the Old or New Testament, they went to these apocryphal writings, they incorporated these apocryphal writings, borrowed them from the wrong sources. That's why we now today know using source criticism that much of the Quran is from the wrong source, borrowed from the wrong texts. What about the two compilations of the Quran itself? If it is internal and complete by 632 AD, why were two different Qurans created within 20 years? Let's start with the first one. To understand this, you need to go to Sahih al-Buhari. Al-Buhari is probably the most authoritative one who actually describes these compilations. You have to go to volume six, Hadith number 509 and 510. These are classic ones. Everybody knows what I'm going to say next, and most every Muslim I know knows about what Al Buhari says. According to Al Buhari, in 6509, between 632 and 634, this is right after Muhammad died, the first caliph Abu Bakr did not have the Quran text written down. Umar, the second caliph, who was with him, warns that since many who memorize it had died, Therefore, a large part of the Quran may be lost. So they asked Zayd ibn Thabit, who is the secretary of Muhammad, to write it down. So that means that why the t after Muhammad died, the Quran had yet to be written down, according to Al Buhari. Okay? All of it's on the Arabic on the right, and there's the English text to it. I'm just summarizing it on the left. Thabit felt it was too difficult to write down because he was, it was something which even Muhammad didn't do in his lifetime. As we move on, to the same compilation. Later, it says that Thabit finally agreed and took five verses, and looked for verses, sorry, finally agreed and looked for verses collected from palm stocks, stones, and memories of surviving warriors. So therefore, he had nothing to go on except what other people had memorized and pieces of palm stones. This first compilation remained with Abu Bakr, the one that he, at times only one person remembered a verse, according to Surah 9, Ayah 128 to 129 is what it's referring to. This first compilation remained with Abu Bakr, the first caliph, then with Umar, the second caliph, then with his daughter Hafsa, and she, according to tradition, she put it under her bed and left it there for about 20 years. Then we go to Al Buhari, volume 6, verse 5, 10. Hudaifa was afraid that the people of Syria and Iraq had different recitations of the Quran, so he asked Uthman to have the Quran written down a second time. A second time. So this is the second recension. Look at the date, 652. We're now 20 years later using Hafsa's first compilation. So they take that first compilation, the first codex of the Quran, they take it from Hafsa, who has it under her bed, and they give it back to Zayd ibn Thabit, who is the one that wrote the first recension down, the first compilation. Uthman orders four compilers, along with Thabit, Zubair, Alas, and Hisham, to rewrite the text. Okay? Let's move on. If the four had any disagreement, they were to write it in the Quraysh dialect. Now hold on a minute, stop right there. If you know Arabic, there's a problem right here. Anybody who knows Arabic knows that in order to have dialectical differences, you need to have diacritical marks, or you need to have vowelization. That's why if you go to anywhere in the Arab-speaking world and buy a newspaper, let's say in Cairo, Egypt, 
If you buy the newspaper there, it will not have vowelization. Why? Because anybody who is in Morocco or in Jordan or any other country that has a different dialect will not be able to read it if it has the dialects for the Kyrene text. In order to sell papers in more countries, they keep the vowelizations out so that everybody can read it in their own dialect. Therefore, in order to have dialectical differences, in order to have a Qureshi dialect, you need to have vowelizations, that's the Dhamma, the Kasra, and the Fatta, and you have to have diacritical marks. You have to have the dots above and below the lines. There were no diacritical marks in the 7th century. Vowelization and diacritical marks were only invented in the 8th and 9th century. That's 100 to 200 years later. So how could this have been a problem in the 7th century? Well, look who's writing this. This is Al-Buhari writing this in the late 9th century, when there would have been diacritical marks and vowelization. So what Al-Buhari is saying is he is redacting this back to the 7th century without ever studying his own history. He didn't realize that he's making an enormous error here. But today, we know that this could not have happened that early. Then Uthman sends a copy to every Muslim province. How many provinces were there at the time of Uthman? Count them. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. How many is that? Nine provinces. If a copy was sent to nine provinces, that means there must be nine Qurans that were created in the mid-seventh century that we should be able to find today. I would like Muslims to provide one of those nine Qurans. It's not me saying this. This is Al-Buhari saying this. Okay, I'm just quoting Al-Buhari. We know that there were nine provinces at that time. Why can't Muslims even come up with one copy of those nine codices? Once the copies of Uthman's second compilation were sent to the nine provinces, he then ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. Why do you burn manuscripts? Well, the answer is very simple. You burn manuscripts that disagree. Now remember, these are not diacritical differences. There is no diacritical marks. There are no dots in any of these manuscripts. This has nothing to do with vowelization. The Dhamma Kasa Fatta, these have yet to be invented. So if you're burning manuscript, you're burning consonantal text. Manuscripts that only have consonants. Ooh, I love that. Which means they have, no, these have nothing to do with the Ahruf or the Kira that Muslims are talking about today. Ahruf and Kira were not invented yet. There was no reason to have Ahruf and Kira this early. Because in order to have Ahruf, for those Muslims who are listening, they're on the internet, and those who are in this room who are Muslims, can you see what I'm saying? This is not an Ahruf or Kira. These seven Ahruf that Muslims talk about cannot have existed this early. Are you listening to me? Why would you burn manuscripts unless there is something you are trying to censor? Wouldn't it be great to have everything that was burned to look at so that we could see what they censored? So, concerning Abu Hari, why didn't God, first of all, choose a language which could have accommodated the Quran. Isn't that rather odd of God to choose an Arabic which could not even accommodate his language because it did not have the diacritical marks or the vowelizations that early? Since he already had two other languages that he used with previous revelations, Hebrew and Greek, why would God in his wisdom have chosen such a uncivilized text? Secondly, why didn't God choose a man who could read or write? If that was really his only function was to reveal, have this text revealed to him, then why in the world would God choose somebody who could not read and write to give the greatest and final revelation of mankind? And why, therefore, didn't that man, Muhammad, write it down? He had 22 years to write it down. What happened that he died before it could be written down? Thirdly, why didn't Muhammad learn to read and write, for heaven's sakes? He had 22 years to do so. More so, he did have a secretary named Zaid ibn Thabit. What do secretaries do if they don't write? Why in the world did Zaid ibn Thabit not write it down? See, these are questions we need to ask Muslims. I've never heard a Muslim answer these questions. Isn't that the job of secretaries? Why didn't Abu Bakr make copies and disperse them to the nine provinces in 634, as Uthman did 20 years later on? 
And how could there be dialectical differences in the mid-7th century when dialects required diacritical marks and vowelizations? These were not introduced until the 8th century, and they were not finalized until possibly even a century later. And most importantly, why then did Uthman burn all the other copies? Doesn't that suggest that they didn't agree? And wouldn't it be great to have them to compare with today? Where are the copies of the Quran sent to the nine cities? They would only be 1,400 years old. That's not very late, folks. If you come to the British Library, I will show you the Sinaiticus, which is the entire New Testament of our New, Test of our New Testament, from the 4th century. That's 300 years before the Quran. Right next to it is the Alexandrinus, which is both the Old and New Testament from the 5th century. That's 200 years before this date. If you want to go down to the Vatican in Rome, you can see the Vaticanus, which is from the mid-4th century. That's 300 years before the Quran was put together. In fact, today we have 365 either partial or complete manuscripts of the Bible in our possession before the 6th century. Why is it that Muslims can't even find one Quran from the 7th century that's complete and unchanged? Why, if Uthman standardized the Quran to just one copy, are there now a multiplicity of different Arabic Qurans today? And what about the earliest extant manuscripts which do exist? Should we not take a look at them to find out just how similar they are to our present Huff's text? So let's look at the six earliest Quranic manuscripts. This is the material that I introduced in 2014 in my date debate with Dr. Shabir Ali. If you want to see that debate, just go up online and just put it on YouTube, the classical debates, J. Smith versus Shabir Ali. Over a quarter of a million people have now watched that debate. What's interesting is Shabir Ali has yet to respond to all the accusations and the challenges we gave at that debate in Toronto. So let's go through some of the material that I introduced then, four years ago. Now, remember, the nine codices set to the nine cities in 650 AD. By 650 AD, we already have this whole area here. Does this work? See that, this whole area right here under the auspices, under the control of Islam. By the time that Abdul Malik comes to power in 685 AD, we have all the way from Andalusia over here on the left, all the way over to India. So from Spain, what is Spain today, to India was under their control. So if this were the case, certainly there would have been someone who could read or write at that time. We do know of four metropolitan codices that became very popular according to the Islamic traditions. The Codex of Ubay ibn Qab in Damascus, interestingly, his codex had 115 chapters. The Codex of Abdullah ibn Masud in Kufa, his codex had 111 chapters. The Codex of Abu Musa al-Ashari in Basra, his codex had 116 surahs. And then Zaid ibn Thabit's codex from Medina, his codex had 114. So even the four metropolitan codices, according to the earliest Islamic traditions did not agree, did not even have the same number of surahs. But let's look and see what we now have today. Today there are really only six manuscripts that are in existence that are extant, that means they still exist today, which are from that era. Now Muslims have always claimed that these are from the time of Uthman. These six are part of the nine that were sent out by Uthman in 652. And Many, as you saw from the claims we had at the very beginning, Shabir Ali certainly claimed that the Tashkent, the Samarkand, the one in the middle, and the Ma'il, the one on the right, were from the time of Uthman. And you'll hear Muslims make this claim over and over and over again. But let's look at these six earliest. The Topkapi manuscript is in Istanbul, in the Topkapi Museum there in Turkey. That is probably the best of all the manuscripts. The Samarkand manuscript is in Uzbekistan there in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. The Ma'il manuscript, known as the 2165 manuscript, is in London in England at the British Library. The Paris Petropolitanus manuscript is in Paris at the Bibliothèque Nationale there in France. The al Husseini manuscript is found in Cairo there in Egypt. And then probably the most exciting manuscript, the latest one to be discovered, is the Sana'a manuscript found in, which is placed in Yemen, there in Sana'a in Yemen. What do the scholars say 
their conclusions concerning the six earliest Qur'ans. Now, I'm going to use two Muslim scholars, Dr. Professor Ekbeladin Isanulu, who is the founding director general of Irsisa from 1980 to 2004, and the secretary general of the organization of the Islamic Conference Research Center. And I'm going to use also Dr. Tahir Atukulic, leading scholar in Quranic studies, ex-president of the Turkish Religious Affairs, deputy in the Turkish Parliament. The reason I'm using these two scholars is because these are the only two scholars who have looked at all six manuscripts. They were given five years to look at them between 2002 and 2007. They came out with their research in 2009. It was printed in English in 2013. I received it at that time, and that's why I challenged Shabit Ali to our debate in 2014 in Toronto on September 29th. And that's why it's important that we use their research, because they are the ones who have been the only ones who have had access to all six manuscripts. And what do they say? Professor Isanalu says, we have none of Uthman's Musaf, so none of these are from Uthman. None of these are from 652. Nor do we have any copies from these Musafs. These Musafs date from the later Umayyad period. The Umayyads began in 661 up until 749. So from 661 up to 749, the later Umayyad period, which means long after 652. Dr. Altakulic agrees, says no serious scholarly work has been done on them. These Musafs date from the early to mid 8th century. They are not Uthmanic, nor copies sent by him. Let's look at the top copy. And this is the one that probably the Muslims like the most because it is the most complete of all the manuscripts. al Takulic says that it is date to the second half of the first century AH, which would be from the second half of the first century, which starts in 670 up into 720, and the first half of the second century, which goes from 720 to 770. So basically what he is saying is that this manuscript is anywhere between 670 and 770, that hundred years. Remember, Muslims have always said that this is from 652. So he's saying that parts of it are from the second half of the first century, which is from 670 to 720, and other parts, at least three surahs he knows about, were added at a later date, possibly between 720 to 770. Even though we would like to publish this sacred text as the Musaf of Caliph Uthman, our research indicated that it was neither the private Musaf of Caliph Uthman, nor one of the Musafs he sent to various centers. There are deviations from grammatical rules and spelling mistakes in the Musafs attributed to Caliph Uthman. He concludes that there are 2,270 instances where there is a difference from the consonantal skeleton of the Fa text. What's the Fa text? That's this text that we're using today. This is the Fa text. This is the canonical text. So there are 2,270 manuscript variants. That means words or phrases different in that manuscript than the book I have in my hand. This is not the same Quran. Are you hearing that? Hugely important. Look at some of the differences. Surah 14, 38 in the top copy says, you know what we conceal and what he revealed. In the Kyrene text, the 1924 canon, it says, you know what we conceal and what we reveals. From he, it goes to we. Who is, if they look at the difference there as to what that does to the theology behind that. Surah 3, Ayah 158. If you should die or be slain, you shall not be gathered. The Kyrene text now says, if you should die or be slain before him, you shall undoubtedly be gathered. It completely contradicts the first verse. Here's a complete contradiction between the top copy and the Huff's text that we're using today. Let's look at the second manuscript, the Samarkand. The Samarkand was considered to be the best of all these manuscripts. It was brought to London a number of years ago. I lived in London, my wife and I lived in London for 25 years, and I remember going down to see it there at the British Library. It's known as a monumental text, very unsophisticated. Script helps to date it, but what's interesting is what Alta Kulic and Ekmaladu say. Both Dr. Alta Kulic especially says the Samarkand is not Uthmanic as it dates from the 8th century. Six reasons to discredit this Musaf, he says. It has undisciplined spelling, it has different writing styles, it has scribal mistakes, it has copyist mistakes, written by someone with little experience, with later editions, and only goes up to Surah 43. The Quran has 114 surahs. So much of the Quran is missing. However, within those 43 surahs that do exist, there's only one surah that's complete. 24 surahs are partial, and 18 of them do not even exist. 
So when even Muslims say it goes up to Surah 43, most of it is missing within those 43 surahs. Why haven't we been told this before? Why haven't Muslims admitted to this? And why do they say that this, that this uh, codex is complete? Shabir Ali has said this for years and years and years, that this is a complete text. It's because no one bothered to look at it until these two gentlemen did. The Ma'il, the 2165 manuscript, which is there in London. Now, we do know about this text, because this is within the British Library. The style of writing helps to date it. It is what they call a Ma'il. That means a slanted text. That is a Hijazi text. This is not a Kufic text like the others. This is a much earlier text. What's interesting is that it only goes up to Surah 43 as well. It includes only 53% of the Quran, dated by al Quraysh to the early 8th century by Dr. Martin Lynx, who was curator for the British Library for many years. He puts it to the late 8th century. But this is not the 7th century. Are you noticing there's a, there is a pattern going on here? So already both manuscripts are the 8th century, not the 7th century. The Halusengi text, monumental codex. Take a look over here on the right, and you can see there are some problems. Can you see some coverings? We'll get to that later on. We'll show you that many of these manuscripts have that difficulty. Altakulic says of the Huzengi text, this is not with money. It is dated from the early to mid 8th century. It was stated that the Cairo copy might have been written in the order of Abdul Eid Azaz bin Marwan, the governor of Egypt. However, the reason for reaching this conclusion has not been explained. So he does not know who wrote it but he does know it's not the seventh century. François de Roche, who's considered to be the world's leading scholar in the Western world, calls it a monumental script, and he puts it to a much later date because it's a monumental script. Note the blue arrows. Are you looking at those coverings? We'll get to that, because this is probably the most disturbing part of these manuscripts. Hold on, we'll get to it in just a bit. The Paris Petropolitanus manuscript, which is in Bibliothèque Nationale, Rudimentary script, a different script, a script helps to date it as well. Interestingly, this is a compilation of a number of different manuscripts, just portions. None of them are complete. In fact, the largest uh, manuscript amongst this collection only contains 26% of the Quran. The Arab 330 only contains 15% of the Quran. The third one contains only 4.2. So where is this idea that these are complete Qurans? Nowhere are any of these complete Qurans. None of these are complete codexes from, and look at the date. The date is from the 8th century. When you look at the Petropolis, look at Surah 14, Ayah 37, and compare with the Kyrene text. Our Lord, they take, take, that they may establish prayer and make hearts among people has been changed to so make hearts from people. We'll get into more of these later on. This, I don't want to get into the significance now because we'll come back to this. The Salam manuscript is proving to be probably the most problematic of all the manuscripts. This is the, 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 most, the most exciting because it was only discovered in 1975 in the mosque in Sana'a as they were cleaning the dome. They came across a trapdoor. When they opened up the trapdoor, hundreds of manuscripts fell to the ground, which is not unknown because when Qurans start to deteriorate, they hide them up in, and they put them for safekeeping up into domes of many mosques. In this case, when they came across this particular manuscript, no one could read it because it had no diacritical marks. It had no dots above and below the line. It had no vowelization, as none of these earliest manuscripts did. And they could not read it. So they flew down two scholars, Dr. actually three scholars, Dr. Gerd Quinn, Dr. Bothmer, Von Bothmer, and Dr. Oleg all of them from Saderland University in Saarbrücken in Western Germany, considered to be the world's leading scholars on early Arabic script. They were flown down in 1981 to look at this manuscript, and they quickly took pictures of it, put it onto microfilms, and their microfilms were then confiscated by the Yemeni government, and were not released to them until 1997. I went to see Gerrit Quinn, and he allowed me to take these pictures of the Sana manuscript here on the left and in the center. As you can see, just from that page that's opened up there on the left, there are two completely different scripts. Surah 19 is on the right side, and when you come down to the yellow mark, it jumps to Surah 22. What happened to Surah 20 and 21? Written in a script that is from 705. There's no diacritical marks there. There's no vowelization. Surah 20 then begins on the left-hand side of the page in a completely later script, much later script, a late 8th century script. Page on the right is early 8th century. The page on the left is late 8th century. Can you see the problems? What's happening here? 
Carl Heinz Olig says of the Sana, the Quran began to be compiled in the last two decades of the seventh century with other versions continuing until the ninth century. Gary Quinn goes much further and he says the oldest parchments and papers of any Quranic manuscripts is found on this. So this is the earliest of any of the archaic manuscripts and he dates it to 705. But they are found that he says, yet more than half of the text is ambiguous letters which need dire critical marks for understanding. Adding vowels help correct mistakes. Changes in the orthography are found in geographical traditional schools. But this son of manuscript is more interesting than the others because it turns out to be a polymcess. What is a polymcess? A polymcess is what happens when you have a codex or anything written on animal skin as this is. Most all of these manuscripts were written on deer skin. The nice thing about deer skin is if you make a mistake or if you don't like what you've written, you can just wash it off and then write over top. The problem is after hundreds of years, the ink in the lower layer starts to bleed through. And that's what exactly happened with this Sana manuscript. So let's look and see. They noticed that there were two layers to this script and the lower layer started bleeding through because we're talking about 1,300 years later. They then were able to separate the two layers using ultraviolet lights. Now, though we knew about this, we never really were given access to it. There you can see, using ultraviolet lights. Can you see a lower layer there and an upper layer? The lower layer is, is the lighter one. According to scholars today, it was written between 671 and 705. The upper layer was written from 705 and later, because it had additions that were probably added 60 years later. Now what was interesting is, we want to ask, what is the difference between the lower text and the upper text? And why was the lower text erased? Well, possibly the text was faded and was illegible, that's why they did it. Possibly the text was inaccurate and needed correcting. Possibly the text was obsolete and needed updating. And possibly the text was nascent form of the later upper text. The book that has finally come out on it just came out last year, written by Dr. Asma Hilali, called the Sana Palimpsest. She is the first now to actually write and publish. You can get her book. Read and see what she says. What she says is basically what has been echoed by not only Dr. Gary Quinn and Elizabeth Quinn, who've done the most work on this, but also Sadegi and M. Gudarzi, and also then Elizabeth Quinn. They all agree that there are more variants in the lower text than in the upper text. What is interesting from her book, she says that the Salam Palm Palm says is basically made up of 63 verses. The lower text has 63 verses, but it has 70 variants within those verses which do not agree with the text I have in my hand here. Which means almost every verse has variance. Now, Hilali, who is a Muslim herself, trying to come up with some type of reasoning, suggests that this may be part of a reading text, a school text. This may be a, something that students have put together. That the upper text was there. Uh, were, but the problem is even the upper text has variance from what the, the Quran that we use today. Elizabeth Quinn, who's done the most work on it, says that the lower text was in the process of being corrected and made more precisely canonical. Thus, the two layers were stages in a process of canonization. She, su she suggests that the corrections predate the upper text and were so many that at some stage the corrector abandoned the corrections and the text was palimpsested. In other words, it was washed off and rewritten over top because they just had too many differences. That's her conclusion from what she has seen. When you look at the lower text and compare with the upper text there in the slide above, you can see that there are 63 of these verses. Amongst the 63 verses, there are 70 variants. 25 times verbs and nouns are different. The articles are different. Participles are different. Conjunctions are different. Prepositions are different. 29 times it has isolated letters. Expressions are different. Entire sentences 16 times. Note some overlap within the same verse. Sentences that are different, expressions that are different, verbs that are different, nouns which are different, prepositions, over and over. You can see there are so many differences. We don't have time to go through all of them. Here are just a few examples. But Allah has cursed them for their injustices in the Sana. Um, says today it now says, but in fact, Allah has cursed them for their unbelief. Can you see how that changes the theology of the text? From injustice to unbelief. Which is it? And which one of these is the one that's in the eternal tablets in heaven? Because they could say two completely different things. Let's look at some other examples. There's many here, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. 
Here's another one. The mosques of Allah are only to be maintained by those who believe in Allah. This is in Surah 19, Ayah 18, in the last days. And he did jihad, struggled in the name of Allah, and did fear anyone but Allah. For it is expected that those who are successful be the rightly guided. That now in the Kyrene text, now says the Hafs text, 1924 text, says, perform the Salat prayer and give zakat and fear none but Allah. Completely different verse. They've added now perform Salat and zakat in the Kyrene text, the 1924 text. Here's another one. Let's go back to this one. Ask forgiveness for them or do not ask forgiveness for them. If you should ask forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah does not forgive them. Indeed, Allah does not guide. Today now it says Allah will not forgive them because they disbelieve in Allah and His Prophet and Allah does not guide. Now His Prophet is added to the text. Can you see how that changes the theology? You could do a whole doctoral research just on that one verse. In fact, every one of these would be a thesis for a doctrine. When you look at the upper text compared to the lower text, even the upper text does not agree with the 1924 Kyrie text. We're going to get back to this Kyrie text that I'm referring to. Conclusions? There are variants in the upper text as well. This suggests that a standard text had not been canonized even in the early 8th century. These reading circles that Hilani refers to are fallacious because parchments are very expensive. You would not waste animal skin on students. More than that, you would not then preserve them for 1,400 years. More than that, if this is the earliest script that we have of any Quran, notice, the lower layer of the palimpsest in the sana is the only part of the Quran that we can find from the late 7th century. Why is it that this is the earliest that we can find, and yet it does not agree with the Quran in 70 areas in just 63 verses? Why would you preserve something of that magnitude for 1,400 years? I would suggest that Quinn probably has a correct one. She says this is a pre-Quranic text which does not correspond with any 8th to 10th century narrative. And that's why it disagrees not only with the other manuscripts, it disagrees with the Quran that we have today. Why are these layer palms just the earliest ones? And where is the original Quran from which these supposed reading texts were derived? Hilali doesn't answer that question. To date, no Muslim has answered that question. There is just a vacant silence. Can we conclude, therefore, that these two palimpsest layers are an example of a nascent Quran in its early formation? Are either of these two layers parallel to the eternal tablets in heaven? Since these are so different from the Quran we are using today, then where is the original manuscript for the 1924 Hafs text used around the world? We're still waiting. Now, on to the carbon dating fiasco introduced in 2015 with the two Birmingham folios. You probably all remember in 2015 when they came up with these folios uh, that supposedly were the oldest Quran in existence, dating from six, um, 568 to 645. Muhammad was born in 570 and died 632, so this follows the life of Muhammad. All over, the, all over the press showing that this is the oldest Quran in existence. What's fascinating to me is that the Birmingham folios are only two pages, the front and back of two pages. This is not a manuscript, these are just two folios. And what's interesting is, have you noticed no Muslim scholar has come forward to support the claims that the Birmingham University claimed and BBC flashed all over their screens in 2015? There's a reason for that. Look at the dates, 568 to 645. What's wrong with those dates? When was the Quran finalized? When was the Quran finally written down in its final form? 652, seven years later. Even if you use the latest date of the carbon datings, it's still seven years too early. You see why? No scholar has come forward to accept these dates. And the reason has to do with radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating is one of the most inexact of sciences because there's such a range of dates. 568 to 645, you're almost talking about 100 years. And you do not go with either end of those dates. You, it uses the bell curve, so you would use the median date, which would be around 610, which would make it earlier than the Quran. Because the Quran, according to Islamic tradition, was only begun in 610. So Quran, how can you have these two folios that early? Look at the content of these two folios. 
There's Surah 18, Surah 19, and Surah 20. And look at what they refer to. They refer to the story of Moses, which would have been borrowed from the biblical text. They refer to the seven sleepers of Ephesus, which have not only, a, I don't know where that is borrowed from. And they have referred to Du al Karanai, who is Alexander the Great. These are external to the Quran. These are all stories borrowed from other sources. If you borrow from other sources, then of course your borrowings are earlier than the material that you write on. Am I correct? By definition, if you borrow, they are earlier. Why haven't Muslims noticed this? Be careful of what you claim. But if you're going to use carbon dating, then let's look at what they have seen, what they have found on the Sana manuscript, probably the best of all the manuscripts. Let's look at the four car carbon datings in the four labs that have looked at these manuscripts and notice what they have shown. I'm now referring to Julian Christian Roback in Larabi Dan Quran, his book that came out in 2015. Roman looked at the carbon dating research which was carried out on nine separate folios of the sauna collections, above and beyond the Birmingham folios. These carbon dating results were carried out in four different laboratories, in Lyon, in France, in Kiel, in Germany, in Zurich, in Switzerland, and in Austria, in England. These are four of the prominent labs in the world today who work with carbon dating. Take a look at what they found. Now, let me just explain what you're looking at here. This over here, on the far right, over here, is the Uthmanic Recension. That's 652. That's when the Quran was finally written down. This blue, these two blue dots, is the life of Muhammad. That's from 570 to 632. Are you following that? Look at these four on the left over here. These four on the left were dated from 370 up to 500. This one was dated to 405 up to 450. This is dated from 475 up to 550. This is dated from 500 up to 550. Those four from four different laboratories of the Sana manuscript all predate Muhammad, predate the Quran, and predate Islam. How many years? If you want to take the latest date for all of these, these are a good 50 to 100 years before the Quran which means the Sana manuscript predates the Quran by a good century. Can you see the problem here? Using carbon datings, be careful about using carbon datings. I wouldn't use carbon datings. Nonetheless, all four Sana A examples dated at four separate laboratories completely predate Muhammad, the Quran, and Islam. All the folios, including the Sana A, B, C, D, and the Birmingham folio, except for E, predate the Uthmanic recension. They're all too early. You can't have a Quran that early. Not in the 4th and 5th century. Sorry, the 5th and 6th century. Since all four Sana A examples dated at four laboratories completely predate Muhammad, the Quran, and Islam, these must be either earlier writings from which the writers of the later Quran borrowed, or I would suggest that probably the better answer is be careful of carbon dating. Carbon dating is completely inexact. I would not go with carbon dating. But Muslims must be careful if they're going to value and say, we finally found two folios from the time of Muhammad, then they're going to have to go with the other carbon datings that place the same folios almost two to three centuries before the Birmingham folio. Now we get to the late diacritical variants. These have proven to be some of the most damaging material. And much of the work, in fact, everything that I'm giving you tonight is not my research. Let me repeat that. Everything that I'm introducing tonight has nothing to do with me. I didn't do any of this research. These, I am not capable of this kind of research. I am only the messenger who's communicating this material because the people who do this research do not want to go public with it. Except this research is done by a friend of mine named Hatun Tosh. But she decided to go and find out about these dire critical marks. Now remember, she does not speak Arabic. She does not read or write Arabic. She's Turkish. And she went all over the Muslim world and had others go for her. Excuse me, she didn't herself go. She went on others and asked to find out Arabic Qurans that disagree with each other. She has now found 31 different Arabic Qurans. We repeat that. She has found 31 Arabic Qurans, not translations. Every one of these are written in Arabic. Found and purchased in three countries, Morocco, Jordan, and Yemen. 
Now, let me explain what I'm going to do next. In order to understand this, I'm going to have to give you a little Arabic lesson, okay? So you understand where I'm going. When you look at this picture on the right, you will see it just has letters. But there's no dots above and below the line, right? So for a Muslim reading that, it's very confusing. You cannot really read that unless you take and try to understand the context. These are letters without the diacritical marks. They are also without any vowelization. The fata, which is the ah sound, the dhamma, which is the u sound, and the kasa, which is the e sound. That's found in the Samarkand manuscript. Here's another example of, a, of the Sana manuscript, and you can see it has no dots and below the lines. That's what I've been talking about. It has no vowelization, no curly cues above it, no slice, uh, little not mark below it, nor a mark on the side of it. That would be the dhamma, the kasa, and the fata. Here's uh, another example of an early rosan. This is the, the Tokkap manuscript, which is in Istanbul. Now, there are diacritical marks being added in. Can you notice that? These have a few diacritical marks, but they're all written in red, which means they were added at a later date. This was not part of the original text. Here's another early Shiite Quran. Notice Ali's Quran, according to tradition, still with no diacritical marks. So why were diacritical marks in Bible's needed? Let me show you why. Those, uh, that is the alphabet of the Quran. 28 Arabic letters without dots in the 7th century. That's what they would look like in the 7th century. The problem is you need to find, of those 28 letters, six of them are unique. The Aleph, the Kaf, the Lam, the Mim, the Ha, and the Wam. Of the 28 letters, only six are unique. All the other 22 letters need dots above and below the line to delineate them one from the other. Are you following that? That's the problem with Arabic. Before those dots were created, there was no way to read this. Why? Well, take a look. When you look at just one smiley face, let's just look at that. If you put one dot above it, it becomes a na. If you put two dots, it becomes a ta. If you put three dots, it becomes a fa. If you put one dot below it, it becomes a ba. Two dots below it, it becomes a ya. Which means you can have na, ta, tha, ba, ya. Five different letters depending on where you put the dots. You thought Chinese was difficult. <laughs> Take a look at that. That's why it's absolutely important that the diacritical marks were added. But these were only invented in the 8th century. These did not exist in the 7th century when these manuscripts supposedly were created. And every one of these six manuscripts that we're looking at did not have these dots in them in the 8th century. You can get five different letters with the same smiley face, depending on how many of the five dots you use. If you use the same smiley face, connected together, just say three of them together, look and see what happens. When we add dots to just these three smiley faces, we can produce 19 different words. There are the 19 different words. That's why it's absolutely important that you, you have to have added diacritical marks and vowelization. Hatun then looked and wanted to look at these 31 Qurans. Now, what she noticed was this. Here are the 31 she had. Al-Susi, Abijafar, Yaqub, Duri, Abi. Ibn Amr al Basri, Ibn Amr, Khalaf al Kashar, excuse me for my pronunciation, Al Light Ibn Khalid, the Wash Al Azam way, there are many different Wash. Here's another Wash, Al Asbahani way. There is the Ibn Jamaz, there is the Duri Ibn Amr al Ah, there is Khalif. I'm going to continue going much faster now because it doesn't matter whether or not you see what they're written. These are just 26 of the 31 she has now been able to procure. 26 of the 31 that she now has in her possession there in London. Now, who are these individuals and what are these names? These names are all students on the right side of the graph. These are students who come from teachers that are in the middle who come from those five cities. Medina, Mecca, Damascus, Kufa, and Basra. Medina and Mecca are in Saudi Arabia, Damascus is in Syria, Kufa and, and uh, Basra are in what is today Iraq. So five cities producing five stu teachers who then have 37 different students. But take a look, let's look more carefully at that one right there, where the black line is. 
That is known, that is the student known as Huffs. Huffs is the Quran that I have in my hand today. This is the text that we use today. But he is only a student from Kufa. Look when he died, 796. If you look at those little brown cloud figures, look at the numbers. Al-Bazi at the top, 1,094 variants in his text from the Quran we have today. Balu, 1,700 differences. Hisham, 1,300 differences. Khalif, 2,600 differences. Coming down to Abu al Hadith, 5,000 differences between his Quran and the Quran we have today. By the time you get down to Hafs, half th two thirds of the way down, we, they, we need to ask why is it all of these Qurans are so different? Now, it's not Hatun has done the work on this. These are Arab scholars who are now looking at these texts. They have now found 59,776 differences between just the 26, I'm sorry, the 23 that they've looked at so far. They haven't even got to 31 of them. They've already found almost 60,000 differences. Yet we have been told that there's only one Quran and that every Quran is exactly the same. Why have Muslims been lying to us all these years? If we can find 60,000 differences using diacritical differences, then why have Muslims never told us this? So when did these differences begin? Well, look what Hafs died, 796. That's 144 years after Uthman that Hafs put his Quran together. Who was Hafs? Was he a prophet? He was nothing more than a student. Why is Hafs important? Hold on, we're going to get to that right at the end. Readers and Transmisters versus Hafs. The variant verses. Just take a look at some of them. Now, most everyone, whenever Muslims bring this up, they always bring Surah 1, Ayah 4, where Hafs on the left says, the only owner, Maliki, versus the Wash, which is Maliki, the king. And therefore, the translation, the only owner versus the king, well, there's not much difference. And what you'll hear Muslims say over and over again is that this does not change the meaning of the text. Now, I don't have time to go through all the 60,000 differences tonight. I'm just going to show a few of the differences and you decide whether or not this changes the meaning of the text. Let me go through some that, that are probably easier to understand than others. Let's look at this one here. In the Hafs text it says Yukafiru. In the Wash text it says Nukafiru. The translation is, and he will remove XP from you some of your misdeeds. The Wash text says, and we will remove expiate from some of your misdeeds. Significance, does Allah remove our misdeeds or do we remove our misdeeds? Can we, either this is Allah plural or humans, do what is reserved for Allah alone? Can you see, this is, has huge theological implications. When you say that this doesn't change the meaning, you could write a doctrine on this, just these, these two differences here. Let's look at another one. Here's one, Qatala versus Kutila. In the Hafs version today, it says, and how many a prophet fought with whom were many worshippers of the Lord? In the Warsh, it says Kutila, which translated says, and how many prophets were killed with whom were many worshippers of the Lord? Significance, did prophets simply fight or were they killed? If I were a prophet, I would rather fight than be killed as the former survives. Here's another one. Kalimatu versus Kalimatu. And the word of your Lord has been fulfilled in truth and justice. None can change his words, and he is the all here and the all knower. <laughs> the Wash says, and the words of your Lord have been fulfilled in truth and justice. None can change his words, and he is the all here. Is the word of God fulfilled or the words of God fulfilled? Notice in the Huff's version, the singular Huff's word does not agree with the plural form of the second sentence. So when the Hafs was finally written, it actually has a grammatical mistake built into it. The Warsh is probably the better translation. So here you can see not only is it different concerning who does, what, how many words God has, but it doesn't even agree in the Hafs version. Al-Riyah Bushra or versus Al-Ri Nasra. 
And he it is who sends forth the wings, bearing good news before his mercy is in the Hafs version. In the Alight Ibn Khalid version, it says, and he it is who sends forth the wind as scatterers. Does the wind bear good news or does it scatter rain clouds? It seems the wind has two completely different functions here. You cannot say that this doesn't change the meaning. It has huge significance concerning not only the fact that they are variant, but the fact that they don't even agree. Here you have Nafu and Nu'azib versus Yufa and Tu'az. In the Hafs it says, make no excuse, you have disbelieved after you had believed. If we forgive some of you, we will punish others amongst you. In the Ibn Kathir version, it says, make no excuse, you have disbelieved after you had believed. If some of you are forgiven, others will be punished amongst you. So will the hypocrites be forgiven or punished, or were they forgiven? It looks like a student completely changed the text later on, suggesting later tampering. Here you have Lhasa Hirun with a Dagar Aleph. Ijaz likes to claim that almost all of these variants in the Tok copy are Dagar Aleph, and that does not change the meaning. Let's look and see what a Dagar Aleph does do with these two texts. Lhasa Hirun using a Dagar Aleph, the Wars does not have a Dagar Aleph, and it's just Lhasa Hirun. So on one side you have indeed, this is surely a magician, with the Dagar Aleph. Without the Dagar Aleph in the Wash text, it says, indeed, this is surely a work of magic. So is revelation to a man the work of a magician or a work of magic? There's a confusion concerning whether it is a man or an action happening here. It does not only change the word, it changes the meaning and the significance of the entire verse, if you add or do not add a Dagar Aleph along A. Here you have Minha verse Minhuma. I surely shall find better than this when I return to him. Versus Washford says, I surely shall find better than both of them when I return to him. Will the companion find a better place or a place better than two others? Who are the two others in the wars of whom he will be better? Huge significance theologically when you see the importations of what that means. Let's look at some other ones and then we'll go on. In the Hafs it says, Ibadana with the Dagar Aleph. Here's another case of a Dagar Aleph changing the meaning. In the Albazi rendition, it's Abdana. And members remember our slaves, Ibrahim, Isaac, and Yaqub, owners of that which comes later. Versus, and remember our slave singular, Ibrahim, Isaac, and Yaqub. Are there three listed slaves of Allah or just one? I'm afraid Albazi doesn't know how to count because you cannot have a singular referring to three people. So there's a grammatical mistake already by just taking the Dagat Aleph out. Chapter 43, verse 19. And they make the angels who are slaves of the beneficent females. This is Ibadu versus the Rah rendition and says, and they make the angels who are in the presence of the beneficent females. Now there are two problems here between these two texts. Are the angels slaves of Allah or simply in the presence of Allah? And number two, is it the slaves or those in Allah's presence who will be made females? If I were an angel, I would prefer being in God's presence than a slave. And if I were an angel, I would prefer if only the slaves were made females, thank you, being a male myself. So 46, I have 15. Isana versus Husna. And we have enjoined on man doing good to his parents. Versus, and we have enjoined on man beauty to his parents. Are men supposed to be do good or be beautiful to their parents? As a parent myself, I would prefer my son be good rather than be good looking. Can you see how these change the meaning of the text? I'm just giving you a smattering of the 70,000 that we, uh, sorry, the 60,000 that we've now discovered. Here's Surah 49, Ayah 6. Fatabayun Yanu versus Fatatha Batu. O you who believe if a rebellious evil person comes to you with news, verify it, lest you harm people in ignorance. Versus, O you who believe if a rebellious evil person comes to you with news, stand firm, lest you harm people in ignorance. Do we verify a bad person's news or stand firm? Verifying news is more practical than just standing still and doing nothing. Creatures versus the innocent. Are we Christians the worst creatures, or are we innocent, depending on whether or not Hafs or Wash is used? What are innocent Christian Jews and polytheists doing in hell? 
So you can see the watch completely not only changes the reference point, it says something completely different about us as Christians and Jews, and also has huge theological differences or importation in just that verse. The conclusion? Hatun has found 31 of the 37 possible Kira'at collections. She has located 59,765. When I say she, she hasn't done any of this. The Arab scholars have done this for her. Between just 23 of these collections, many of these differences not only change the text, but in some cases even change the theology. So they are not trivial as Muslims like to contend. The one finally chosen in 1924, the Hafs, was created 144 years after Uthman. Don't these roughly 60,000 differences suggest massive human interventions? Yet these aren't the only variants. There are even more damaging continental variants, which we will now look at. The early continental variants are by far the most damaging. Now, I have to be careful because I'm not permitted to show you everything I know about this because this has yet to be published. I was hoping that it would be published before today. In fact, Dr. Dan Brubaker, who has done the most journal work, this is part of his, the uh, his doctoral thesis, is the one that has done the best work on this, is just now coming out with this book. It's supposed to have been come out, it was supposed to have come out this summer, and then it was delayed till October 31st. Well, we're now the 23rd of, no of November, and it's still not out. The publishers are still holding off on it, I think because they realize how damaging this is going to be to Islam, and they're very skittish about it, much like the City University is skittish about having this lecture in their halls. But this is the book that's going to come out. You can then buy it. And this is just 20 examples of corrections. Uh, he has found over 4,000 consonantal corrections. Let me repeat that. He has now found over 4,000 of these consonantal corrections. This is not diacritical marks. This is not vowelization. This is not the diacritical problems that we just looked at. This is much more damaging. What kind of variance has he found? He's found hundreds of insertions, hundreds of erasures, hundreds of erasures overwritten, hundreds of old writings without erasures, hundreds of selective coverings, and hundreds of selective <coughs> coverings overwritten, as well as tapings. What do I mean? Well, here you can see insertions, words that have been added at a later date, a post-production addition, in some cases much, much later. Here are erasures. You can see where they've erased letters, removing and overwriting. There is an aleph that has been removed, we think. Erases overwritten. These are different words with written writings over top. So they erase the word and then they've written over top of it. Later, adders, later letters added in new script and ink after the original. Overwriting without erases. Here they haven't even bothered to erase them. They just wrote over top of them, which helps us because we can see what they've changed. You can see entire sentences have been changed above the lower sentences either to restore a portion of the text that's faded with time or change the text entirely. And you can see, because you can read the text underneath, in many cases they take change the text entirely. And then selective coverings. These are probably the most damaging because it's obvious that there's a censorship. Take a look at the middle one. There is so much censorship in just one page, you can hardly read the text. So much has been covered over. Intentional changes directly over portions of the text. Select the covering with overwritten. Here they have covered it over with the taping, and then they've written a completely different word over top. You can see in the middle and over on the right, there are some coverings where they didn't write over top, and then there are some coverings where they have written over top with other words later on. And then there are tapings. Over here, when you look at the one in the middle, when uh, Daniel Brubaker saw this, he couldn't figure out why that tape was there. He thought maybe it was damage to the manuscript, but when he looked on the back side, there was no damage whatsoever. It's obviously they were trying to censor the text. They were trying to hide the text that was there. So let's look at some of these. And I was going to look at some of the top copy. Let's look at some of the top copy manuscript, the ones the Muslims favored the most. Look at the top copy manuscript. Let's look at some of the variants. Now remember, here is one here in Surah 2, Ayah 225. The verse in the Tokok copy used to say, as a provision, if only we had been provided with this before. Now it says, as a provision, they said, this is that with which we had provided before. A provision has been added to the text to make it conform to the current 1924 Hafs text. So you can see right there on the right side, you can see where the cup has been added in to the text above the line. In Surah 2, Ayah 196, the verse in the Tok copy now includes that surely Allah, that surely Allah has been added to the text to make it conform to the current 1924 text. Note the insertion on the far right third line coming down. You can see it right off to the right. That has been inserted at a later date. So 3, Ayah 31. 
Note the insertion on the far left, second line. You can see it there in the middle of the, of the, uh, of this, of the slide. It used to say, Allah will forgive you. It now says, Allah will forgive you and your sins. Your sins has been added to the text to make it conform to the current 1924 Hafs text. Are you seeing a pattern here? Conform to the 1924 Hafs text. In every case, these additions, these insertions, are conforming them to the 1924 Hafs text. Insertion in the Tokapi in Surah 3, Ayah 47. Note the vowelization on the inserted word. An entire word is inserted at the top. Masha Yasha. Ma Yasha in above the line, circled in red there. The verse in the top copy reads, Thus Allah creates when he decrees a matter. In the 15th center, someone added what he wills with all the vowels that are missing from the text around it. The t a text around it does not have vowels, proving that this is a much later edition. Well, you can see it's above the line. That should be obvious. Make it in agree with the standard 1924 Huff's text used today. Now here's another insertion in Surah 9, Ayah 72. The verse in the top copy now reads, It is. It is has been added to the text to make it conform to the current 1924 of text. This is in the middle line, the second line, sorry, there in the middle of the slide. Here's uh, Surah 66, Ayah 8. O oh, you who believe, repent until you give by its sincerity. There you can see, it now has been changed to, O oh, you who believe, turn unto Allah in sincere repentance. Completely different. Changes the, the line, not only changes the verse, but changes the theology as well. Hugely significant. So 5, Ayah 176, the verse in the top copy used to read, and are they siblings? The 1924 text says, in if they are siblings, possibly a noon was erased. Here's an eraser. Note that it could be noon. In the previous example of someone erasing a previous text to conform to the 1924 Huff's text. Here's another example of erasure in Surah 7, Ayah 31. 38, sorry, the verse in the top copy now reads, He said to each is a double. Here's an example of someone erasing a previous text and then writing the current text over top. We cannot know what they erased. That's right there in the middle of the slide. I could go on and on. There's so many of these. Surah 73, Ayah 20. A single word has been erased between the words two-thirds and the night. Unfortunately, we will never know what the word was which was erased. Nonetheless, the current text now agrees with the 1924 Huff's text. So 70, Ayah 32. Here's the overwriting without erasing. They've just written over top. They in the text is written over top, replacing something which is not discernible. Because of the change, it now agrees with the 1924 Huff's text. When you look at the Husseini text, there are examples of bearings, and much of these are coverings. Franco de Roche notes that you can see this page. Note the coverings over the text signifying hiding or censoring the original written text so that it now corresponds with the 1924 Huff's text. Wouldn't you love to be able to lift up those coverings and see what they're hiding? I wish Muslims would do that so that we can see how much of the text has been censored. I see one, two, three, four different coverings just on that one page. Here's another covering. Something between the words, so eat and until. The 1924 Quran reads, eat and drink until the white thread of dawn appear. What was originally covered in the area, which now reads, and drink, we will never know. But whatever it was, it is not the Quran Muslims read today. Surah 2, Ayah 191. This is the page I showed you earlier. Phrases covered in the Hosea are, drive them out from where, and if they fight you, then you kill them. And if they desist forgiving, merciful, the religion belongs to Allah, enmity, and in the mouth. What was originally covered? We will never know. Why was this portion of text censored? And why was so much of this page censored? And why have Muslims never told this before? Why is it only now that we're finding this out? It's only because of Dan Brubaker's uh, the doctoral thesis that we even know about this. And that's only been out since 2014. Here's a covering again. Aluzeni manuscript, Surah 3, Ayah 161. That which is in the modern edition, which Muslims use, reads, He brings, and judgment is covered here. Why would they censor this? Here's an eraser from the Husseini text in Cairo, Surah 49, Ayah 6. Let's go to the Parasino Pretopolinus text. Insertion in the Pretopolinus. There you can see easily, note the vowelization on the inserted word. So not only is the word inserted, also, bimithli, also has the vowelization and also the diacritical marks showing that it was, it, was, uh, it was added at a much, much later date. 
Here's an eraser overwritten in a pair of spectrum models in Sura 3, IO 171. They erased it and then they overwrote it, but you can still see part of the erasing to see what they've changed. They've overwritten with the word favor. It has been added later by a different scribe, come with a completely different script handwriting. Here you have Sura 23, IO 86. It originally lacked the word al sabah which means the seven. This word was added to conform to the present Huff's canonical text. Say, who is the Lord of the seven heavens? You used to say, who is the Lord of heavens? The seven was added in. There at the top, you can see it, to agree with the 1924 Huff's text. Here's an eraser on the Petropolis text. Those they are the nearest. However, they, they, whom, has been rubbed out to conform to the standard Huff's canonical text. Looking at the Sana text, there are many of these. Sana Musaf manuscript in Surah 3, Ayah 104. There is a combination of letters that do not make sense written over some text, which in the modern 1924 Quran reads the commanding. So here they've erased it without much significance. Chapter 7, verse 158. Letters are erased between the words you all and whom. The modern Hafs reading does not contain what was erased. We will never know what they erased, but they obviously standardized the text. Surah 49, Ayah 15. It originally had the word Mu'minu, which means they believe. But then a later scribe added the word Nun, changing the word to Mu'minun, the believers, conforming it to the 1924 Hafs text. Conclusion, there are over 4,000 of these corrections discovered by Dr. Dan Brubaker to date. That's just what he's discovered so far. They include insertions, erasers, coverings, and tapings. They were all carried out long after the original manuscript were completed. They all bring the manuscripts into conformity with today's standard Huff's text. Does this not also suggest human intervention and manipulation of the Quranic text over the centuries? So why was this Huff's text chosen as the final canonized text? And this is my last point, and we will end with this. When you look at the Huff's text, we need to understand what and why the Huff's text was chosen. Do any of you know why the Huff's text was chosen in 1924? Does anybody here know? Does our Muslim friend know why the Huff's text was chosen, sir? Do you know why it was chosen? No one seems to know. You need to go back and see what was happening in 1924. To do that, you need to go back to Egypt. You need to go to Cairo. In 1924, the Department of Education needed a standardized high school Quran to standardize high school Qurans in order to unify the Qurans used for their exams. There were so many different Qurans, a good 37 different Qurans that we know about, that there was no way that they could have standardized texts because their answers were all different. So they needed to standardize the texts for the high school exams there in Cairo, in just the city of Cairo. They approached Muhammad ibn Ali al husseini al-Haddad from Al-Azhar University for this task. He, along with the committee, chose the, 19, uh, the 796 AD Hafs Quran as the official Quran to be used in high schools throughout the city of Cairo. There were 36 other compilations they could have chosen, but they chose Hafs, though we don't know why, and they never explained to this date why they chose that one out of the other 36. They then took all the other Qurans which disagreed, took them out in a boat, and threw them into the Nile. They sank them in the river, which means they're still there today. Have you heard this before? I had never heard this until just two months ago. In 1936, the government of Egypt realized how efficient the Kyrene model was, and so decided to make the Huff standard for the Qurans for all Egyptian schools. So they, made it, they decided to make it countrywide. They named it the Farouk edition, named after King Farouk, who came to power in that year. The Egyptian model was so successful that the Saudi Arabian government in 1985 decided to make the Hafs Quran the official Quran for the entire Muslim world. 1985. This was known as the Fad edition in honor of, king of the king of Saudi Arabia. So our present Hafs Quran, this one that I have in my hand here, is not 94 years old. It is only 33 years old, which means many of us are older than the present canonical Quran, including myself, which makes me feel pretty proud. <laughs> this Quran that I have in my hand today has only been around the rest of the world for 33 years. 
Where in the world do Muslims get off saying that this Quran is from the time of Uthman in 652? Final conclusions. Remember what we started off. We were not interested in an uncreated or sent down Quran. We want to find an archaic, complete, and unchanged Quran. Thus, we're looking again, I repeat it again, we're looking for one Quran manuscript dated from the 7th century, complete and unchanged. Right? That's what I asked at the very beginning. We looked at these 11 areas. That should be 11, not 5. What did we find? I started out with 5 two months ago. I've now gone up to 11. The modern Muslims make absurd claims for the Quran. They say it's unaltered, it's unedited, it's untampered in its original form. Not a single letter nor diacritical doc has changed. They say so that today's Quran is identical with the Quran of 1300 years ago. But what did the Muslims, early Muslim scholars say? They would never say what the Muslims are claiming today. They were all agreed that parts of the Quran were lost, disappeared, forgotten, canceled, missing, overlooked, changed, modified, substituted, and even eaten by sheep. They never considered the earliest Quran to be complete, nor unchanged, but a book like any other, written, edited, and then changed, not by God, nor by Muhammad, nor by Uthman, but by later men. We saw the historical synacrims. It introduces a Samaritan, a mosque, coats of chainmail, and even crucifixions too early. Then it denies the history of Jesus' crucifixion and gets the wrong Mary. It confuses the Qibla in the Kaaba, Pharaoh in the Tower of Babel, and even Haman, and erroneously makes Alexander the Great an amazing engineer while placing futuristic coins in the wrong era. This suggests that it was written by finite men and failed men, and not by an infinite God. When we looked at source criticism, we noticed that Muslims claimed that the Quran was written on eternal tablets in heaven. Yet we now find that much of it was borrowed from previous 2nd to 5th century Jewish apocryphal writings. They were written long after the Bible was canonized, proving not only that the Quran is eternal, but is not eternal, excuse me, but that it owes much of its content to the wrong material. These apocryphal writings were all rejected by the earlier Jewish and Christians, not only because they were so late, but because they contradicted the Bible itself. When you look at two compilations, one by Abu Bakr between 632 and 634, and the other by Uthman in 652, according to Islamic God, chose a man who was illiterate, a language which was unreadable, to reveal his last and greatest revelation. Though the Quran is supposedly eternal and complete, the early Muslims needed to compile two different versions of the Quran just 20 years apart. Once they compiled the final canonical version, the Uthmanic recension, they then burned all the other copies which didn't agree, destroying any hope of finding the original. They then sent nine copies of the canonized text to nine cities, yet we can't even find one of them today. When you look at the six earliest manuscripts, we notice that according to Muslim and secular Quranic scholars, these are six of the earliest manuscripts, all of them, all of which were supposedly written at the time of Uthman. That's what the Muslims claim. Yet none of them are dated to this mid seventh century. They all date to the eighth or ninth centuries. None of them are complete. None of them agree completely with each other, and none of them agree completely with the 1924 Huff's canonical text, which I have in my hand, right here. When you look at the lower layer of the Sana Palimpsest, the lower layer is dated from 671 to 705, the upper layer is dated to 705. The Sana Palimpsest, both the lower and upper texts, are different from the Quran that we have today. The lower text has, is only 63 verses, has 70 variants, which don't correspond to any known later textual variant, and the upper text has further variants. The conclusion, the lower text seems to be a nascent Quranic script, which was then rubbed out, corrected, and then rewritten over top sometime between 671 and 705. When you look at the four carbon dating lab reports, we notice that all four Sana A examples dated at, at four separate laboratories completely predate Muhammad, the Quran, and Islam. Thus making it by, uh, these may be earlier Arabic writings from which the writers of the later Quran borrowed. Since all the folios, including the Sana ABCD and the Birmingham folios, predate the Uthmanic recension, they contradict the classical account, suggesting that we dare not trust that account to understand when the Quran was truly written. Conclusion, either we throw out the, R the uh, radiocarbon 14 dating as untrustworthy, which is what I would suggest we do, or we throw out much of the later 9th century classical account of the Quranic compilation. You decide. When we looked at the 31 different Arabic Qurans, we noticed that no one seems to know how to define either Akhruf or Kiryat readings. Yet everyone is absolutely sure that there were seven Akhruf or Kiryat before Uthman, and they are equally sure that they made no differences in the meaning of the text. 
Yet Ahruf and Kidatz could not have existed after Uthman since he standardized it in 652. Yet we now have, we have now found 31 different Qurans with over 59, almost 60,000 differences between them. These differences not only change the meaning, but often the theology as well. The conclusion, the Quran today was created in 1924, yet attributed to a student from 796, while disregarding 36 others, though even his manuscript does not exist today. Looking at the early consonantal variants, we have found 4,000 consonantal changes, thousands of insertions, erasers, coverings, and tapings, all carried out long after the manuscripts were completed. I would suggest that they were all done possibly after 1924, so within the last 94 years. We have no idea because they won't let us have access to these manuscripts to date those variants. All done to standardize the text to conform to the canonical Huff's text. The history of the 1924 Huff's text, it's obvious that the Huff's text was chosen by a committee because for no reasons that we can know about, the other 36 Qurans that disagreed were all taken out on a boat or sunk in the Nile, which was then canonized first by the Egyptian government in 1936, then by the Ibn Saud family in 1985, a mere 33 years ago. Rather than critically compile a text derived from the earliest manuscript evidence available, they simply chose one student's compilation, regardless of whether it matched those earliest manuscripts. What does this prove? The two compilations prove that men changed the Quran in its earliest period. The six manuscripts prove that men created six different Qurans between the 8th and 9th century. The two layers of the Sana manuscript prove that men created a nascent Quran in the 7th century. The four carbon dating lab reports prove that men borrowed stories created long before the Quran. The 31 different Arabic Qurans prove that men even today still read a variety of Qurans. And the 4,000 consonal variants prove that they are still changing and standardizing the text. The 36 non hafs Kira'at variants dumped into the Nile prove that when Muslims find problems with their Quran, they either burn them, wash them, or sink them to destroy the evidence. And you notice, all three are now admitted by Muslims today. From what we have researched and found, that the Quran was not created by God at all. The Quran was not sent down to Muhammad between 610 and 632. The Quran was not complete by Uthman in 652. The Quran was not unchanged in the last 1300 years, and the Quran was not finally compiled until 1924. Thus, the Quran is a mere, not more, excuse me, 33 years old. Even, the, even my amplifier doesn't like what I just said. Many of us in this room are actually older than the Quran. Yet, by casting doubt on the Quran, our Muslim friends can consider a better book, the Bible. And I end with that. Now, I'm sure I ruffled my Muslim friends uh, a little bit here. I'm sure those who are watching this on the internet are not going to be happy with what I've done tonight. But have you noticed, everything I've done tonight is the exact same process that was done to the Bible. I have used redacted criticism. I have used source criticism. I have used literary criticism. I have used historical criticism. These criticisms were all created against the Bible in the 1800s by people like Wellhausen in the University of Tübingen in Germany. We as Christians have had to deal with these criticisms for 150 years. These criticisms, when they were applied to the Bible, by 1905, along with Darwin's uh, evolution, uh, Darwinianism, devastated the church in Europe, decimated the church in Europe. Darwinianism and historical criticism. The church has never recovered in Europe. Today, only five to seven percent of people go to church. But it woke up the church in the rest of the world and we decided that we needed to answer every one of these criticisms. So we went and we found, we're able now to find and discard, we pretty much can answer the documentary hypothesis, JDB documentation. We can pretty much answer every one of the criticism against redacted criticism, source criticism of the Bible. In fact, the Bible is the only book today that can make the claim that there is none one artifact, none one tablet, not one mural, not one obelisk, not one stella anywhere in the world that contra can contradict a properly understood biblical statement. That is the only book that has passed every one of these criticisms. These criticisms we're now applying to the Quran. What I've done tonight is exactly what Muslims have been doing for the last 1400 years. 
Why is it only in 2018 are we able to come forward with these kind of criticisms against the Quran? And when we tried to introduce this in a university right next door, we were banned yesterday because the Muslims call me a hate preacher. What have I done tonight that's hate preaching? Is this not what should be asked at any university, on any campus, anywhere in the world? And I ask Muslims today, you cannot keep banning us from introducing this, not just on universities, we're now introducing, this is going up on YouTube. Muslims are going to have to deal with these manuscripts. They're going to have to deal with these variants. I cannot show you all the consonantal variants, especially the most damaging one. We're going to go full front with all of the variants, all 4,000 of the variants. And we're asking Muslims to please look at these variants and stop making the claim that the Quran goes back to Muhammad. You can't make that claim anymore. Stop saying that the Quran can be traced back to Uthman. You can't say that anymore. Stop even saying that the Quran came from the 7th century. The best you can say is the Quran that we have in our hand today, some of it probably came from the 8th century. Then much of it was changed from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. Finally was canonized and made the Quran that we have today in 1924. Which means this book I have in my hand is not 1400 years old. Is not complete. It's only 94 years old. That's the best you can say. And we're asking Muslims to be honest and transparent. Listen to these criticisms and stop banning us. And uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I would say thank you because uh, until right now I was listening a uh, one-sided story uh, because in my I was in a Muslim country. So now I'm here, so I am also listening uh, to uh, uh, something from the other side. Uh, I have read something uh, and, uh, so, so that I should say it fluently. Uh, like being a Muslim, our faith is not complete without believing in Jesus, Jews, or uh, David. So we believe in all the prophets according to our preachings. Whatever, whatever, whenever I see a true practicing Christian, I feel happy. And I always thought that, okay, he is making God happy by a root of Jesus. And I am also doing the same via root of Muhammad. My opinion is, instead of Muslims should say something about Bible and Christians should say something about Quran, we should convert on similarities of both the religions and live with harmony and same goal that is to make the God happy with our good deeds. Absolutely. God bless you. I agree. Let's make each other happy. But also, let's don't run away from hard questions. No one's saying that we should not be discord or that we should not have any relationships. Muslims are my favorite people. I've spent 37 years working with Muslims. Why would I dedicate 37 years of my life if I didn't love them? I absolutely love men like you. But I think it's important that Muslims, rather than just say, let's have accord, realize that they also need to think seriously about the claims they make about them. We've asked Muslims over and over again, can you defend any of these 11 areas? To date, I have yet to find a Muslim, and I've done debates with almost all of your major Muslim scholars. The first I was with Dr. Jamal Badawi in 1995. That's 23 years ago. I gave 10 historical challenges at Cambridge University. 23 years he's had to answer this. I still love Jamal Badawi. We're still good friends. We were just in communication in September. There's nothing about friendship or accord. We're very friendly. But he has yet to answer those 10 historical challenges 23 years later. Adnan Rashid, I have debated five or six times. Look at Adnan Rashid, one of the most robust Muslim debaters in the world today. We are absolutely good friends. But we completely disagree on the Quran and the Bible. And there's no reason why we should be afraid to say that. Of course we disagree. But the claims Muslims make about the Qur'an, they must stop making. And they must agree that the Qur'an is nothing more than a man-made book. Please agree with that for me today. And if you really want to find a book that actually answers every one of your questions, if you, when you want to find a core, why don't you come back to the Bible? Because the Bible is the only book so far that has passed every test. Every historical attest has been foisted against the Bible. Because of the fact that it has answered every test, I give you the Bible.
much better than the Quran. And there's no reason why we should disagree. Prophet Bishop, thanks for coming tonight. And thanks for being the only Muslim that shows up. Great. Is there another okay, just one, more, one more question? Yeah. Um, well, so the, the major question of this picture is there is no uh, Quran from the, the age of our Prophet Muhammad, yes? Yeah, I would say that's the main concept. But you know, our the Arabic, I'm from Egypt, and the uh, Arabic language is uh, totally at the age of the, our, our Prophet Muhammad was uh, a language of speech, okay? The language of speech, not ja, ja, speech, speech. So it's a spoke, spoken language. Yes, we have the letters at this time, and some people can write down different uh, uh, texts, but the, the major uh, practice of our language was just to speak with it, okay? Uh, and there is no problem if, if you can memorize different and, and uh, large uh, texts without, uh, without uh, writing it down. And now in Egypt, you can, you can find uh, children at the age of five and they can memorize the whole Quran. Okay, so there is no problem with the Fatha, Dhamma, and the Kasra. Uh, I, I, uh, I learned the Quran at the age of, at the age of five and why then I, I, I memorized the third of it. And I didn't, I didn't know about uh, Fatha, Dhamma, Kasra, no, nothing like this. And I can correct to another one. So this is not a problem that this vocalization of Absolutely. Are you following what he's saying? It's okay. not a problem that we do not have the earliest manuscripts. People no, memorize no, it. No, 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 like this. Okay? No. no. It's so the, you memorized it. We can okay. memorize it without writing it down. Okay, but what okay. did you memorize? What? What did you memorize? We can memorize Quran. What did you memorize? Me? Yeah. Today, these children in Cairo, what, what text are they memorizing? The okay, yeah, yeah. This is the, the, the good are they question. memorizing the top yes, copy? Yes. Are they memorizing the Samarkand? Are they memorizing the Husseini, none of which agree? Or are they memorizing this text, yes, which is the Kyrene text? Okay, okay. Uh, you, you said that Hafs, right, Hafs, or the Hafs text is the, 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 the standard one all over the world, yes? The standard, the standard text, that Hafs. The, the Sana is not the Hafs, no, it is not. No, you said that, you said that Hafs is the standard one. Uh, all over the world, yes? The standard one, yes. yes. Is that what you're saying? No, there is no one Muslim can say this. I'm a Muslim and I can say that Hafs is the standard, the standard uh, text. It's the standard 10, 6, 19, 24. Yes. It's not the standard. No. We have different, we, we call it Qur'at. Qur'at that a way of reading the Qur'an. Okay, so you can say, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And someone can say, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ Kufuan and the Kufuan. You can, this is, this is a, a way of reading. Can I answer this? this? A let, way of reading. Let me answer this, because you're because not this, on, this So let me answer this, you've gone quite long. It's very quickly, there's a quick two answers. You said, first of all, that we don't need the text because it can be memorized. No. And children, yes. let me finish, sir, let me finish now. Yeah. Because you said children have memorized this in Egypt, in, in your not lifetime. In Egypt, I would I agree that it is memorized, but what did they memorize? They're only memorizing yes. uh -huh. this text. This is the question, yeah. yeah. I, I, now, I, I, then I you went to the Kira'at. Let me finish, sir. Then you went to the Kira'at and the Ahruf. But you haven't defined what Kira'at is. Yeah, You've I just given two examples of two Kira'ats that you know, yet there are 60,000 differences. Are you going to go to all 60,000 and tell me that they're all exactly what the same? What is 60,000 different differences between, uh, between our Kira'at? There we have counted 60,000 in just 23 Karat. months. No, no, the, the, the standard Qur'an now and from the past, it, it is just 10 Qur'an, okay? And 10 Qur'an, it is just... Sir, you need to keep up with the latest research. It's up to 37 different Qur'an. 37, yeah, yeah. 10 I, I is what said, you were, I said 10 is all that you have in I your... Said, I said the standard, not the... Other and what is the standard, the half standard? The standard, yeah. Who, who bought this standard? Okay, in, in Egypt, we have... Um, Al Azhar Sharif, you know it. Okay, and there are two schools that le that teach this 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 to uh, uh, different students from Egypt. In sure, my this town, this, this could take all night. Let me explain real quickly where your where your error is. The Kiraat. Let me repeat this again. The Kiraat and the Ahruf require diacritical marks. Yes or no? Yes. When were the diacritical marks introduced? Yeah. 
Okay. And Give the date. Yeah, and I've already said it tonight. Yeah, when yeah. were they introduced? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it was not. It, it was not at the time of Muhammad. Muhammad. Yeah, no, no. Not even in the seventh and century. We have, and we have all Sir, you're talking while I'm talking. Listen to yes, what I'm yes, saying. And you the Kiraat and the Ahruf were only introduced in the eighth and ninth century. These thirty-seven different Kiraat renditions were started in seven ninety-six. And that's so the no late 8th century and went up into the 9th century. These are 140 to 150 years after Muhammad. 37 different schools of Kirat now exist. Not just 10 that you're talking and about. Because the, the, the book you're talking about is only one book with 10 examples of it. That's become very popular in Egypt, I agree. But we know of about another, uh, uh, another 16 of these Kirat that you're not talking about. So can you see, even what you're saying is two to 300 years I, after I, the fact. I can say something, okay? Uh, I wish you, you... Did you hear what I just said? I, I, Can what? you repeat back what I just said? You were mm -hmm. talking while I was speaking. Can you repeat what I just because told you? I didn't, I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't say, say, say all my What did I just say? What's what your the message? Okay. Can you tell me what I just That's told what you? I would say, I would say that, that the most important thing in, uh, for this, this uh, uh, topic is that we Sir, have the shame. You're I, not I listening wish. to what I'm saying. No, no, I am listening the to you. The kids are late or much listen. too late to I use. Listen, I, I, listen, I listen to you when you, you said that there is a difference between you are a magic and your work is a magic. You are a magician and your work is a magic. What is the difference here? There is no difference when you say something like this. Now let me ask everyone here, okay. is there a difference between a magic and a magician? Yes. Does well, that I not say, change the meaning of the text? Sir, can you see? You're not making sense to these people here. Okay, okay. I, 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 can you see I'm why Muslims saying. say this without realizing that their hearers are not accepting okay. what you're saying? But even be, even if so, even if we were to go to all 60,000 differences and show you, I just gave you about 10 or 12 differences tonight. If we were to show you all 60,000, can you see that these are all much too late to even part, be part of this discussion? Who cares about the kid differences? They're not, they don't get into it. Let me finish. Let me finish. They By 800, the 9th century, another 36 appear. Well, can you see that this is much too late even to be part of this discussion? Why aren't you talking about the consonantal differences? The what? The consonantal differences. Yeah. Number J, the last, the second last thing I talked about you tonight. Can, yeah, I can. Did you get what I was saying? About which the one? Which one? You can do These are it. thousands of consonantal differences that have nothing to do with dots have nothing to do with the Dhamma, the Qasr al fatah How yes. are you going to deal with those differences, those corrections, the insertions, the erasers, the coverings, the tapings? Explain to me how those exist if this is an eternal word of okay. God. Okay, I can, can you give me just two minutes, okay? Well, um, in Quran, you, I, I wish you had, you, you, you had mentioned anything about the chain of, uh, of Quran or of readers of Qur'an, okay? In Islam? You're talking about Islam. Yeah, right? that's shame. Okay, so, for me, as a Muslim, to be uh, a standard reader of Qur'an, I should go to someone, scholar, he is a sheikh, okay? And he learn, he teach me how to just read the Qur'an. Okay, and this one was taught by another one. And the other one, was taught by another one. Then Prophet Muhammad. This is the main thing that we, uh, we we say that Quran is Quran from our Prophet because our Prophet uh, teach. Hey, may I stop you right there? Let me ask you a question. Yes. What's your name? Abdullah. The slave of Allah. Abdullah. Abdul. Yeah. Abdullah. Abdullah. Abdullah, slave of God. Yes. God bless you. I love slaves and of God. I'm a child of God. I have so many more authority for as a child and, and than a slave. The meaning, the meaning but Abdullah, let me just ask you real quickly. If you are a slave of God, yes. how do you know that any of those chains said what they said if they didn't write it down? Where are, and where did they write this, these chains of recitations down? Where is this written down, these chains of rec reciters? Written down again. No, this is not the, the most important thing. It is just to memorize the Quran. There are many people that can... Have you heard his answer? Be, be, yes. These yes, were all yes. memorized. Yes. What did they memorize? The they, Tokapi? The Samarkand? The Husseini? At the edge of the... Oh, okay. Jay, Jay, what he's saying is that originally it was just recitation. It was just recitation. Yes, that were I hear this, but can you see the problem with that? 
None of this is written down. And you hear this answer from Muslims all the time. They memorized it, and we have children all over Egypt that can memorize it. But the only thing they memorize is a text that only exists for 94 years. What did they memorize before 1924? Case question is, when eventually something is written down, there are differences between okay, at, the, yes. there, at the age of our prophet, there were uh, some people that were famous they are the the writers of our prophet. Okay, he when he uh, there is a revelation, he uh, he collected them and then said what he he got from Allah, and they read right they 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 wrote down uh, uh, the the text after him. Okay, Abdullah, right but, there. But this was right there. Did you all hear him say it? I, I, Abdullah, I want to let me finish. Did part. you all hear him admit it? They wrote it down. Where are those writings? I, I, that is what I, I, I am going to say. Uh, after this, they uh, after they wrote down that this this was not organized, okay? But not, sorry. organized. Not organized. Not organized. Not organized. Okay. okay. Not. After that, because there were different wars of both at the 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 age of uh, of the Khulafa or uh, the the rulers of Islam after after our prophet, uh, there are many many of of those who who memorized memorized the Quran were killed. Okay, so the the Khalifa was very uh, uh, annoyed about the, the the Quran may be lost because of the the those who can memorize it were killed. And at this age, they started to organize the writing of Quran. It was written at the age of our prophet, but the or to be or uh, written in, in, in an organized way, this was in the, in the, the age of Khulafa Muslimi, Khulafa al, 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 al Rashid. Did yes. I not just put that on the screen? At, yeah. Yes. Were you here when we? I don't yes. know when you came but, in. Did you see when we put that on the screen? We but, know all of what you've told us. You've already. We've already gone through that tonight. But no, you you said that our Quran is thirty-four. What is thirty-four? <laughs> what is uh, thirty-four or uh, years old? What don't you it? just love him? It's Who can great. see that? I I I I Abdullah, I saw I many people you. that. Abdullah, did you come late to the talk tonight? Yes, um, about uh, twenty minutes. Okay. You missed most of everything you have just said. I put up on the screen here. That everything you're telling us is from Al Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 509 and 510. We went through that. Did we not destroy that this evening? And Can I, you see the problems with what he is saying? Even when you look at what Al Buhari was saying in chapter, in volume, chapter 6, sorry, volume 6, 509 and 510, Al Buhari is writing this in 870. This is 240 years after the fact. He's redacting this back onto the seventh century, not realizing that he made mistake after mistake after mistake. You weren't here when we went through some of those mistakes. Number one, Abdul, Abdullah, listen to this. Number one, why is it that they had to rewrite the Quran a second time? You said because there were many other Qurans that were written down that disagreed. Thank you for saying that. Already you're admitting that there were many Qurans at the time of Uthman. Yes, but, but I Number said two, also. let me two, let me finish. Okay. What did... What did Uthman say to Zaid ibn Thabit in Hala, Arath, Harith, and Zubair? Write it in the Qurayshi dialect. Now, do you speak Arabic? Yes. In Arabic, you, in order to have a dialectic difference, you need diacritical marks. You need the dots. Am I correct? Yes. You need the vowelizations. You need the dhamma, the kasra, and the fatah. But you don't need this when you memorize, memorize it. Okay, I, I don't, I don't need... In order to have it written down, to have dialectical differences, you need to have di diacritical marks. But I the don't need it. Sir, I you're not it. listening, Abdullah. I... The diacritical marks did not exist at the time of Uthman. There yes, were no diacritical yes, marks. Yes, yes, so yes. how could there be dialectical differences in the mid-7th century? And, uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. This is what I Uthman said, is saying in the late 9th century. For Muthman, this made sense. In the late 9th century, it would make no sense in the mid-7th century. Uthman is just speaking about his own day. He was not a historian. He didn't realize that there were no diacritical marks to create a dialectical difference in the Arabic text. Mm -hmm. See, you weren't here when we unpacked that this evening. Yes. And this is why Muslims need to be careful.
careful, look and understand that there is error after error, even built in with uh, Al-Buhari's reformation. Now, folks, we could go on well, and on tonight, well, but let me... I, 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 I will finish this part, and there is another small thing I, I, will, go ahead. I would like to say. So, this part, for this part, uh, all what we believe in Islam is just uh, Quran is memori memorizable, and many people can memorize it very easily. And uh, we have the chains that re reach that reach to our, to our Prophet Muhammad, and so we are very confident about about the, the, the writing and the text of Quran. Publish. And and the, the other thing is that you said there are all of these differences in uh, you you talked about kalimatu and kalimat, nashran and bushran, the sahir and the sahir. Uh, slaves of Allah and uh, about about angels and the Qutila and the Qadila, all of these uh, verses and the other the other ones, as an Arabic uh, citizen and uh, as an Arabic uh, human, I know there is no difference in the meaning for the whole verse between all of these. Qutila and Qutila have no difference. No what? Qutila and Qutilu have okay. no difference. No difference. To fight or the, be killed would be a meaning. big difference to me. Yes, yes. yes. In the meaning, in the whole meaning of the verse. Okay, so if, if, if I said that there is some people that were killed when they were, uh, with, with their prophets, and if I said that some people fought with their prophets, that, that doesn't change the whole, whole context, the whole context of this. Of this so let me ask everybody just here. You, 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 you just sacrifice yourself. You Abdullah, you Abdullah, sacrifice Abdullah, yourself. Let me just ask Abdullah. everybody sitting here. Yeah. If you were killed or if you fought, does that not make a difference to you? Oh, <laughs> what is the difference? I would suggest that, that would make the, a big difference to me if I were just fought for the prophet or meaning. if I was killed. I, I am talking about the meaning. You, 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 I am talking about the meaning. You are willing to sacrifice yourself for your belief. This is the... the Thanks, Abdullah. The done. It's been meaning. great to have you here. But can you see, you still haven't picked up what we've said tonight. And understandably, Muslims do not get what we're talking about. Do you all get what I've said tonight? Yes. Are there any questions from the rest of you on what I've said tonight? Are you convinced that the Quran we have in our hand today is the same as the Quran that came supposedly from these six earliest manuscripts? I think one very important thing that you pointed out, uh, Jay, at the beginning was that for, for, when Bukhari writes about the Quran and the recording of the Quran, actually it doesn't seem very important to him that, that these this surah has disappeared, and this one has been lost, and this one has been forgotten. He writes about it as if it's not, as if it's not a, a, an authoritative document for him. It's not a, it's not a matter of you know. We I put a spanner in what you just said. Can you tell me when Al Buhari, the first volume, extant volume, exists today? Well, Do you know? Well, it's we have nothing it's of Al Buhari from the 9th century. Yeah. We have nothing of Al Buhari from the 10th century. We have the first volume from the 11th century of Al Buhari. There are nine volumes of Al Buhari. The nine volumes that we now have today only were introduced in the 16th century. So everything you're going to read from Al Buhari is not from the 9th century, it's more than likely from the 16th century. That's 1500. We're now in 2000. That is only 600 years old. So even what you're saying here, I can put a spanner in that work as well. Can you see, we're just talking about the Quran tonight. If you want to talk about these traditions, if you even want to talk about Hafs's manuscript, where is Hafs's manuscript extant today from 796? Well, that doesn't even exist. So what in the world did this committee in Cairo use in 1924? Ooh, I love it. It makes my job so easy. Can you see that why we're asking these, man? This material will continue to continue to escalate, and that's why Muslims, please listen to what we're saying. Abdullah, you've memorized everything you've told me tonight. This is what you have to say. This is all you're taught to say. But Muslims who are watching this on the internet, you've got to listen to what we're introducing. What we've introduced tonight shows you that there is no one Quran from the seventh century. There's not even one Quran from the 8th century that agrees with the Quran we have in our hand today. All of the six major manuscripts disagree. Even the Qiraat that Abdullah is so trying desperately to help us understand, 
These are only introduced in the 9th and 10th century, and they don't agree. There's 37 different versions, 60,000 differences, and he may go on until the, uh, the moon turns blue, trying to tell us that they are all the same. But none of you are convinced by what he said tonight. Even one simple example between Katala and Kutilu shows you that whether you are fighting or whether you're dying, that's completely different, and I would like to know the difference. If, if Abdullah doesn't know the difference, I certainly know the difference between those two different words. But that's not even the point. The point on we're doing tonight is proving that this book, the Quran, is not from God. It's not from Muhammad. It's not even from Uthman. This book that I have in my hand today possibly could come from a student from 9796, possibly. But I don't even think it's from us. It was put together by a committee in Cairo in 1924, 94 years ago. Made by men, created by men, edited by men. It's as finite as a book as any other. Please, Muslims, stop elevating it to the status of eternality. God bless you. We've had a great night. Thank you, Abdullah, for coming. Thank you, sir, for also admitting. We do tolerate you. We're certainly good friends, and we'll remain good friends even after tonight, okay? Good on you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for everyone. And uh, and after, after, we're running out of time because um, you know.